Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Nice to see you. Welcome. Everybody doing well? Semester off to a great start? Yes, yes, yes. Resounding yes. Okay, well, I am Catherine Frank. I am the chancellor, and I, I'm playing double duty today. So in one role, I will be my regular, introduce a little bit about what this event is about. That's what I usually do. And Scott Cabot, who is responsible for this wonderful series, is unable to join us today. He'll be back on campus on Friday to, to um, place the plaque uh, that celebrates our speaker. Um, but I am, I'm doing his part too, um, which is uh, usually to say a little bit about uh, the speaker as well. So I'm going to begin by telling you about why we are here. Um, and that is due to Scott Cabot, again, who can't be with us today. Scott is an alum of Stout, and he established this series in honor of his father, Arthur Cabot. And he passed away about 40 years ago on September 15th. Um, at, the, at the age of, of his death, he was 64. And his father is, he started a pets products company. Um, he was a founding member of American Pet Products Association. And he was a longtime board member and served um, on the, as the association president for three times. And his father, Arthur, believed that individual companies couldn't be strong without a strong industry. And his view was that everything is part of something larger. And he devoted a great deal of his time and energy to help build the industry he was a part of, and he believed in the sharing of best practices. And you'll see, as you hear this, listen to how this, uh, this uh, series unfolded. So he found great satisfaction in sharing those best practices with others and helping them to start and improve their own businesses. So he was a mentor. He encouraged others um, to, to get involved and, and to build. So as I said, Scott Cabot is our proud alum. And while he was here at Stout, Scott's parents, you know, his, his father, Arthur, um, thought very highly of Stout. They appreciated the education that Scott was getting. And Scott will talk about that, you know, what, what the Stout education meant to him, why he came to Stout, that applied learning, um, that problem solving, that engagement, that mentoring. He'll talk a lot about mentoring. So his parents were very invested in Stout. And so when uh, Scott's father passed away, he wanted to honor his memory. And he said, Scott will say, I don't, want, I don't want him lost to history, at least not right away, um, is what Scott will say. And so when his father passed away, Scott went to then Chancellor Swanson with an idea. And he wanted to continue his father's love of helping others by sharing his experience with others, especially young people. And he wanted to do it at Stout. So the following year, that was 1984, the first Cabot Executive Residency was held. Um, and the inaugural resident was William Norris, the founder of Control Data Corporation. And now, 39 years later, we're here today. There's been a diverse group of leaders um, and, and managers in business industry, nonprofits, and healthcare that have come and served as Cabot Executives and shared their expertise with our community. Um, and now I have the pleasure of introducing this year's Cabot Executive. So William Bill Stair is the next in this long line, this long history of Cabot Executives. And I met Bill, was it last year? Last that we year. Met, we met uh -huh. at homecoming. And he is a 1970 South graduate he currently resides in Boulder, Colorado with his wife, Mary Kay, a 1971 Stout graduate, industrial arts and home economics, industrial right? Industrial tech. Oh, what? Industrial tech. Industrial tech. Mm -hmm. I was close. And home yeah. economics. And any guess where they met at Stout in 1967? You'll never get. Where? A bar. <laughs> Not a bar. Not a bar. Yeah. <laughs> where? Homecoming, bowling alley, the lunch line. 
<laughs> they met in the lunch line in 1967. Um, and so they have shared a, a remarkable journey filled with innovation, creativity, and dedication. So a little bit about Bill. Bill's artistic talents have earned him international acclaim with his award-winning artworks gracing the walls of universities, art centers, museums, and galleries, including our own, uh, across the globe. But his journey to becoming a full-time artist is just one facet of his incredible story. Before immersing himself in the world of art, Bill, along with his wife, Mary Kay, founded the recreational map company Trails Illustrated. And so what started as a, as a humble venture in their basement eventually caught the attention of a little organization known as the National Geographic Society, and it led to its acquisition. So Bill held several prestigious roles that showcased his leadership and vision. He served as the president of National Geographic Maps, overseeing the organization's worldwide mapping operations. His time at the National Geographic Society was marked by significant contributions, where he also held the positions of director and senior vice president. Bill has a strong commitment to making the world a better place, and that extends beyond the boardroom. He has dedicated his time and energy to various causes, serving as an officer and director on several boards. Notably, he played a pivotal role in the Peace Initiatives Institute, an international organization with a focus on achieving long-term peace through initiatives involving children. Additionally, his involvement with Big City Mountaineers, a program offering wilderness experiences to at-risk inner-city teens, demonstrates his dedication to youth empowerment. Um, he has presided over the International Map Trade Association, representing map publishers, seller, sellers, government agencies, and software, software developers from all corners of the world. And as I said, it all started here at Stout. Um, and he is a proud graduate. He received the university's prestigious, prestigious medallion award, which is now, does anybody know what that medallion is now called? Samuel E. Wood medallion. And during his time here, he was actively involved in student government. Um, he was also captain of both the track and cross country teams. And that showcases his dedication to athletics and ac academics. He is dedicated to making this world a better place. I am so honored to be able to introduce this year's Cabot executive, Bill Stair. Thank you. How many of you are first year students? Good. It's been 57 years since I was in your place and just beginning to understand that the college experience was much more than classes and study. In 1965, I was 17 years old and I desperately wanted to be an artist. Willem de Kooning and Jackson Pollock were my art heroes but I didn't become an artist for a lot of reasons just yet. Then 40 years later, I quit the best job I ever had, you just heard about that with National Geographic, to become a full-time painter. So at 56 years of age, I figured I was young enough to start a new career, and why not do what I wanted to do when I was 17 back in 65? So back in 1965, my family and I had no idea how to research, much less how to apply and pay for college. Most of my classmates in Burlington, Wisconsin, did not go to college. So my parents and I sat down with our high school counselor, and he suggested that I work alongside the um, illustrator for our local weekly newspaper. It was called the Burlington Standard Press. So here I am, and I am thinking, Jackson Pollock and Willem de Kooning, and they were thinking doing ads for Elsie's dress shop. So it was a, a little problem there. So anyhow, I'm not sure though at that point if I really did know what I really wanted to do. And I could not afford art school um, or a more selective or elite school at the time. And I doubt that I would, would have even been given a second look. But along the way, I think some people saw some potential, thankfully for me. And one day in my drafting class, Mr. Noreen 
asked if I was thinking about college, and I shrugged my shoulders and I said, I don't know. He said, why don't you apply to where I went, Stout State. A few months later, drop, our dad dropped me off at Fleming Hall. Tuition was, any guesses? Anyone, guess. 10,000, 5,000, any others? 150. You can look it up. Because I've been telling people for years, yeah, it was only $150. And I thought, no, that's crazy. So I looked it up. It's on the internet, $150 per semester. So now, when asked by a friend of my father's, what kind of job industrial tech would pre uh, prepare me for, I said, I don't know. <laughs> Stout was the perfect place for me. It, but it was my launch pad, and, and that's the issue. So today, I'd like to introduce you to a truly great business mind. And this is a dreamer, an adventurer, someone who followed a vision, not knowing where it would lead, someone who may be more relevant today than ever before. And of course, you know who it is. It's Alice in Wonderland. So this is from the book. How many of you have read Alice? OK, all right. How many of you have seen the Disney movie? <laughs> Okay, all right. Okay, so this is from the book now. Imagine Alice and her sister sitting by the river. It's hot. Alice is tired and bored. Suddenly, a white rabbit appears, takes a watch out of his waistcoat, cries out that he is late, and hurries away. Alice jumps to her feet, burning with curiosity, ran after it, and was just in time to see it pop down a rabbit hole. In another moment, down went Alice after it never once considering where she was going or how in the world she was going to get out. She just did it. As a stout freshman, I was required to take physical education. Is, is that required yet? Do you have to take PE to graduate? I had to learn to swim to graduate. That, I'm serious. Well, I mean, that's not a bad idea, but, but we took PE. And it, we had a different uh, thing we did, every, uh, sport we did every quarter. So I'm out on the football field, and our coach, after every thing of touch football uh, during our gym class, would have us run around the goalposts. And I, you know, I kind of lagged behind and jogged in the back, and I was just happy to get back in the gym and shower up. And there were two guys there that would always race. And uh, they, every class, they were like this, going. And so one day I thought, well, yeah, I think I'll just race them. So I beat them both. And uh, they were both high school track champions that were recruited to Stout for track. And so they <laughs> up to me, and uh, they asked me if I was going out for track. They introduced themselves and, and asked me if, was, if I was going out for track. Now, understand that I had not participated in any high school varsity sports. Nada, no, zip, zero. So I said, yes, I was going out for track. <laughs> I loved track. I loved my teammates. I loved practicing. I loved competing. I loved everything about it. When I came back as a sophomore, I went out for cross country, and I pledged a fraternity, goofed around a lot, and became fully absorbed with having a really good time, <laughs> which resulted in academic probation, and I was ineligible for track. And not only was I ineligible for track, but I might flunk out. Now, this was 1967. Why wasn't it a good idea to flunk out in 67? Vietnam War. And I had a very low draft lottery number. So it was as good as one. So I'm thinking, I was really stupid. <laughs> and I was devastated. But then one very cold, Menominee evening, I eased my way into the cafeteria line. Now, the cafeteria used to be in what's now ComTech, okay? That was the student union, and we ate there. This was pre-commons, before the commons was built. So I, I snuck in the line. I don't do that. I hate people that do that. But I had a couple of friends there, so I eased, sidled up alongside of them, eased into the line, and struck up a conversation with this lovely girl in front of me. That was Mary, home ec class of 1971, and we'd been together for 56 years. It was love at first sight, at least for me. And I was at the right place at the right time, and it was the best meal I ever had. 
Okay, devastation, infatuation, love at first sight. How about those for a kick in the butt? I studied hard, I worked hard, I trained hard, and I graduated with an education and experience that would serve me, and of course, with my future wife. So after graduating, we moved around the country on a training program, and we settled in Minneapolis. We focused on buying, remodeling, and restoring a wonderful Victorian home built in 1911. We worked on starting a family, and I began working on my MBA, and I played a lot of rugby. We certainly thought about our future, but we really didn't have any kind of a plan. We just had this vague idea. So let's discuss this, but let's do it with Alice in Wonderland. Okay, one of the great, many great characters in Wonderland is the Cheshire Cat. Do you remember that with the disappearing body and the smile still remains? One day Alice came to a fork in the road and saw a Cheshire Cat in a tree. She asked the cat, now this is the first time she's met the cat. She asked the cat, which road do I take? His response was a question. Where do you want to go? I don't know, answered Alice. Then said the cat, it doesn't matter. Which road do I take? Where do you want to go? I don't know. Then said the cat, it doesn't matter. But it does matter, okay? There was the caterpillar. You remember the caterpillar? He sat on the mushroom with the hookah. So Alice came upon him sitting on the mushroom with his hookah. They looked at each other for a long time, just stared at each other. And then the caterpillar took the hookah out of his mouth and said in a sleepy voice, who are you? Who are you? What are your core values? What are your experiences, perspectives? What are your goals, your passions, your attitudes and habits? that define you. Who are you? Think about it. Who are you and where do you want to go? Is there anything more basic, more important than that? These were the right questions for us to ask ourselves at this point. Now hold that thought. We're going to return to that. I want everybody to stand up. Everybody stand up. This is a requirement. This is, this is your PE since you don't have it anymore. <laughs> I want you to put your hands on your knees. And I want you to go like this. You are now shortstops, shortstops for the Milwaukee Brewers, okay? So let, let me tell you about that. You can sit down now. As a shortstop, you always have to be ready to catch the ball if by chance it is hitting your direction. You need to be in the right place at the right time. You need to be prepared and well-trained and also willing to take a calculated risk and dive for the ball when it's hit over to the side. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. So we left Minneapolis and I went to work for a company in the Milwaukee area. Boy, Stout really came into play here. So I quickly became a product manager involved in the design, production, and sales of a product line, all of which exactly mirrored my courses. Then I became the manager of quality assurance. Again, I took the courses here. Then manager of production, and yes, I understood production methods and processes, care of Stout's 1960s playbook for me. And then I became manager. I was 31 years old and I had 300 employees. Uh, with manufacturing, engineering, industrial engineering, all fulfillment and purchasing operations, and I could not have been better prepared. Sounds like the perfect job. So let's talk about the perfect job. The perfect job can and should provide multiple things like social connection, intellectual stimulation, advancement potential. How about some good pay? And mine did, but it must also align with my own values and there needs to be a sense that I'm working on something important and worthwhile. This was not my perfect job, and I wasn't happy. And now you might ask me, well, who are you and where do you want to go? So Mary Kay, that's my wife, and I talked about this a lot. And we also thought that this was all wrapped up in maybe the most important decisions that we make, the two of us. Who is your partner? Well, we nailed that one. Then. What do you want to do and where do you want to live? Family, and we talked about this. So family was important and, and we want to have kids. 
then either through our jobs or as volunteers, we were passionate about working for causes that involved kids and teens, and also about the environment. We wanted to travel, and we wanted to work together, and we wanted to start a business. So we wrote all that stuff down. We wanted to have easy access to the outdoors, ski, fish, hike, camp. You get the idea of what we wanted to do. In 1964, we visited the Rocky Mountains for the first time. We were in the foothills above Boulder, Colorado. Any of you been to Boulder? Well, there's great foothill mountains right outside town. And we went up in the mountains, and we looked down, and we said, we're going to live in the Colorado mountains. So we started to put a plan in place. We knew it wouldn't happen overnight. These things don't. And we also knew that it might also take multiple interim steps. We started our plan. We wrote down our wants and our needs, you know, our solid must-haves, and then it would be nice-to-haves. We gave them numeric values on a scale. We had them in a spreadsheet. And so we were serious about this. And, and over the next few years, we decided, after multiple vacation research trips, that we wanted to live in one of three Rocky Mountain areas, and then later on an island. I mean, why not, as long as we're doing this and dreaming? So during this time, I completed my MBA and continued to take advanced courses. I was offered a faculty position at two different Milwaukee area universities. No mountains, though. But this got us thinking that, well, you know, maybe, maybe academia might be the right place for me. And like Alice, we were willing and able to try new and different things. So I had lunch with a mentor. He was the president of a local university. And he said, why not take some time and go back to school full time? Don't waste your time on your current job if you don't like it. Learn firsthand if academia is, ready for, is really for you and decide what you really want to do. So that fall, I started working on a doctorate at, the university, at Northwestern University. I was thriving. I loved it. But we were really struggling financially. And it was very, very, very hard on us as a family. While studying one spring afternoon, I heard a sound on the other side of my closed office door. I opened it, and there sitting on the floor was our four-year-old son, softly crying. And he said, Dad, I just want to see you. <clears throat> so you all remember what Mick Jagger said. You can't always get what you want, but you just might find that you get what you need and we were about to get what we needed. So after my first year, I left Northwestern along with a full scholarship, a research assistantship, and we decided to sell our house and just move west. But wait, there's more. Out of the blue, I was offered a job in Colorado, and I said I would take it for two years. And so in 1982, we moved to Evergreen, Colorado. And from that day, overlooking Boulder in 1974, it took us eight years to get to Colorado. Who is your partner? Check. Where do you want to live? Check. Two down, one to go. So when people ask me how we got into the map business, I say by accident. I managed to badly fracture my leg on a business ski outing. And I remember we were in Colorado, so this, this was you took your customers and business associates skiing. I was in a cast for six months. We were going buggy, wanting to hike and camp and ski. I still have the steel bar in this leg. It raises heck in the airports. My surgeon said that I could ride a bike with my cast on. So we purchased three mountain bikes. Mountain biking was very new in 1983. The handlebars were out like this, and uh, there weren't that many mountain bikes available. And also, we couldn't find any dependable or environmentally friendly trails to ride on. So I, can't, I contacted a publisher sent a couple of sample chapters, and we wrote the first two mountain bike guides to Colorado. On weekends, Mary, Greg, our son, and I biked new trails. Mary Kay researched the flora and fauna and history, and I got up at 4 a.m. every morning to write. One book became the number one best-selling nonfiction book in Colorado. So we needed maps for these books. And, and we were thinking about using some that were produced by a, little, or a company in Denver. So I picked up the phone and called and come visit, said the voice on the other line. So as I drove down to visit, I drove through this commercial district in Denver. All of a sudden, I'm in a, a residential neighborhood, and I figured for sure I'd made a wrong turn, and I drove up to a modest home. A kindly looking older woman, who was probably 10 years younger than I am now, 
answered the door and took me into the spare room, which was the company's world headquarters, <laughs> and then into her garage, which was, of course, inventory and shipping. During our conversation, she suddenly took out her watch, just like the rabbit, and said, oh, I'm late for a meeting with my accountant because I am selling my company. On a walk that evening, I told Mary Kay about it, how we could grow this tiny little company that's in her bedroom in, into something much bigger and maybe it would allow us to travel around the world making maps. Well, she stopped, thumped me in the chest and said, what are we waiting for? Let's buy it. So we did. <laughs> Who is your partner? Check. Where do you want to live? Check. What do you want to do? Check. Well, the problem was we didn't have any money. <laughs> but did manage to plunk down a few grand and got the owner to finance the balance. We moved it into our garage in our basement. Got up at four in the morning, each morning, to draw maps by hand. And so we learned how to become map makers. We do this over a light table on a very, very cold concrete floor. So let me stop here. What have I told you so far about being an entrepreneur? You need to be willing to take a chance, a risk, but, but a risk in terms of you researched it. So it's not the same risk to you that maybe someone else sees you taking. You have to figure out how to finance your business and you have to be ready to work long hours. And you need to understand how a business works. Once again, what I learned at Stout directly applied to this business. Everything from printing technology, you had to print maps, quality control. I was going into the printers and, and watching their quality and monitoring it and doing these press checks and everything. Uh, I took marketing here at Stout uh, and the manufacturing process flow had that nailed here at Stout. But I had an MBA. That was a biggie. That really helped us also. So we were getting successful. Our first year sales were $28,000. Now, what, what's tuition here again? <laughs> so anyhow, so, so that was our, our first year sales. Well, we were booming. And, a few, and, and we moved out of our uh, basement and garage to two rooms above a Chinese restaurant. A few years later, however, we continued to grow and we built two office buildings, had a bunch of employees, innovative products, sterling reputation, great customer service. And we traveled around the world and probably to every national park you can name. We kayaked with humpback whales. We walked with caribou herds, had close encounters with wolves, grizzly bears, sharks. I was even kicked by a kangaroo in Australia and twice dodged the charging moose. We, okay, so we used to do these research trips for our maps, so that's when we saw all this, right? So we, would, we took 17 trips to Alaska. We did a lot of maps in Alaska. And um, we would have a plane drop us off and say, I'll pick you up in two weeks if the weather is okay. So make sure you have enough food if I can't get into you. We would clear gravel bars so bush pilots could come in with their planes and land on these gravel bars in the rivers to resupply us. We played baseball at midnight above the Arctic Circle with native kids, and we visited schools and clinics in the shadow of Mount Everest. We developed trekking maps with the profits going to those same remote schools and clinics in uh, Nepal. We provided know-how and equipment and software to start partnerships in Nepal and India. We put our company to work for ideals that we believed in. Then as nonprofit board members and officers, we worked with inner city teens, environmental groups, hiking, trail and land advocacy groups, national park conservation and education organizations, international programs supporting young children in war-torn countries, and more. We had many firsts in the industry, and we pioneered product production and customer service models. We understood our job as supporting and preserving public lands while ensuring that visitors have a safe, educational, and fulfilling experience. So we're this, still a small enterprise when, when you looked at the biggies in the mapping industry. We had a growing, great reputation, but limited resources. And we were wary of big name traditional map companies, as well as the new guys on the block like MapQuest and Google. So we began to look for someone to acquire us, someone to help further uh, propel us 
in the direction that the map business was going. It was our vision, and, and we wanted to do that. We wanted to advance the map business. We wanted someone that shared our values, someone that cared about the environment, was interested in national parks, and someone with a quality reputation. We decided that the perfect and ideal company was, now, now this is shooting for the moon, you know, but if you don't have a target, you're not going to hit anything, right? And, and you only hit what you aim for. And so our target was National Geographic. National Geographic was arguably the most respected map publisher in the world. And how about that for a dream, huh? So we needed to make ourselves attracted to them. We're this little company in Colorado. So how are we going to do that? Well, first thing we did is we hired one of their employees. It was an intern to set up our production workflow to align completely with their production map flow. Then we set out to create a database that we thought might be attractive to them. And we did this by cooperating with a national park related nonprofit just up the street from National Geographic in Washington, DC. Next step was to try to sell this database to National Geographic. So I made the call. And to sell it to them as a way of introduction. We were invited to lunch. And oh, by the way, National Geographic CEO would like to join us. We didn't know until then that National Geographic was actively looking for someone to help take their products from a members-only sales model. Okay, it used to be you couldn't buy a National Geographic map unless you were a member. And they weren't in retail stores. So they were trying to make a transition into retail to the broad American public, world public. In addition, their member surveys said that they loved national parks, so they wanted to increase their cooperation and coverage of national parks. Guess what? We were deeply involved with just about every national park you've ever heard of at multiple levels, from ground level employees to superintendents and directors. And Mary Kay, my wife, was the president of a national park educational preservation and interpretive association. In fact, when National Geographic's CEO met with the director of the National Park Service, he suggested that they get closer to us. Then, I was president of the International Map Trade Association, representing map publishers, map sellers, you know, the, and, and then government agencies, software developers, and then the retailers and wholesalers in more than 55 countries. So we had the park in our pocket, and we had the retail end of it covered. We aimed high, and we were at the right place at the right time. We were prepared. Here came the ball, hit directly at us, and we caught it. We sold our company and signed the documents on the very same table that Alexander Graham Bell, John Wesley Powell, and others sat around and conceived of the National Geographic Society. Two years later, I was asked to head up National Geographic's worldwide mapping group commuting to Washington, D.C. from our homes in, you ready? Winter Park, Colorado and St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands. Okay, when in Colorado, we commuted over a mountain pass and one very bitter cold winter morning we had a terrible car accident. I put my arms around Mary just as we flipped over a guardrail, hurtled upside down and backwards over a 40-foot cliff and down a hill, bouncing over large boulders. No screams, no yells, just the sound of the car smashing over the boulders and then crashing through the forest. In a few seconds that seemed like hours, we both waited to die. We, we knew it was the end. And it was okay, as we talked about it later. We were buried upside down in deep snow. Our car was packed with branches and snow. I remember thinking we were gonna suffocate as if in an avalanche. We couldn't see out the windows. Amazingly, neither one of us was injured and somehow we wiggled out a back window and clawed our way up in waist deep snow. The state police told us that there had been two other accidents there in recent years. We were the only survivors. So why am I telling you this? We were not meant to die. It wasn't our time. We re-looked at our lives to confirm what was really important. Adversity and calamity are part of life. 
They're crucible moments, impossible to avoid. Don't wait for your moment to decide what is really important in your life. Do it right after you leave here. I mean, do it soon. Know what's really important. Okay, students. It's not easy being a student. The balance may be, in my case, sports, academics, a job, a relationship, and maybe all kinds of other activities. It's, it's almost impossible to do right. And it doesn't get any easier after you graduate. The pressure is the same, even if the responsibilities and activities are different. Job, family, night school, kids are sick, everything else. And it's a juggling act and you have to make some compromises and concessions. So think about what is really important to you. And it changes, right? It changes with your life at different stages of life. But at this point in time, what is really important to you? And you still have all these things you need to do, but what is it that you can't lose focus on? So fast forward to 2004. I leave the best job I ever had. I leave National Geographic to become an artist and follow that dream of a 16-year-old kid. I threw away my resume. It no longer defined me. I was now an artist. I learned to paint again. I painted small, bright, figurative work. It was abstract work, and they loved it in the Virgin Islands. You know, I used Caribbean colors and dancing women, and, and, uh, but there had to be more. I was not feeding my soul, but it, too, it took a few years to recognize my voice, my mission, to find my voice. Well, actually, my voice found me, and it was in the back of my head whispering, what good is your art? What does it really accomplish? Does it matter? So I started to broadly explore victims, witnesses, and survivors of war, discrimination, violence, abuse, bigotry, addiction, you name something. And I was thinking I was painting it. So viewers interpreted my work within their own subjective context, related to their own experiences which is what I wanted. But again, the voice came back and said, how can you honestly paint these? You can't relate to all of these issues. Well, I can't. But I can relate to addiction, not as a victim, but as a witness, and I know about stigma. You see, my sister OD'd and died 10 years ago. She might still be alive if it weren't for prescription opioids and the stigma that surrounds addiction. So here's the deal, with alcohol and drug abuse, it's never just one person that's impacted. So the, paint, people, uh, people that I, the faces that I paint, which you can see in, which direction is the gallery? Behind. Behind me, okay. If you go over there tomorrow for the opening, those faces are those people, the victims, the witnesses, and the survivors. I found my mission, and this was it. With stigma, families are embarrassed, communities judge, Doctors are dismissive, and users think they are not worthy or worse evil. Stigma is a barrier to prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and recovery. So the first step to alleviating stigma is to normalize the discussion, to get people to talk about it. And that helps people understand that substance use disorders are a treatable medical condition, not a moral failing. And then you need to be able to tell people so that they understand where they can get help. Stigma became my focus. All my exhibits now are a forum for education and communication, the place where you can come for the art but stay for the message. So my sister od but you know, to the millions of people affected, I could be part of the solution. Many people have passionate reactions to my work. They share their heartfelt stories. Some say they intend to get help or take the first step to finally start that intervention. Some thank me simply for recognizing them. I exist. One moment. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the connection. Please try again in a moment. <laughs> I exist. I'm not alone. <laughs> So one, one, one woman wrote me and said, after seeing a painting of mine online, that she knew I understood her and she wanted to die. The next morning, she looked at this very same painting and this time saw hope in the woman's eyes. 
And she then understood that she too could have hope. And she said to me, you saved my life. I believe in the power of art to help people, and I am motivated to take it, my art to the next level in this service. Now, after saying all this, you probably think, are they, okay, so this is real common. So, so people will come into my show, shows and they'll say, oh, we thought you were this morose, dreary, sick guy who painted these paintings. And I go, I'm not, I'm not. Art is fun, but there's a dichotomy there, isn't it? Art is fun but I have a grave mission to tell you about. And um, uh, that's my mission. But let me show you how much fun art is. This is my grandson. What's my message? Be joyful. You know, you can't always, but try to do it all the time. I have a friend who says that her alarm goes off at 2 o'clock every day in the afternoon to tell her that that's her moment to think of something to be grateful for. Think of that. Be joyful. Be grateful. Okay, let's shift gears. I want to return to Alice. Everything is changing so fast in Wonderland, but Alice doesn't fully comprehend, nor does she know how to deal with it. Choices are made without having the time to consider the options or unintended consequences. For instance, the White Rabbit determines that the best way to get Alice out of his house is to burn it down. Now, this sounds very much like some fears we have about artificial intelligence and unintended consequences. And it's true that today we are getting our job done with what, not that many years ago, looked like magic. The rate of change is impossible to keep up with. We are developing technology that we don't understand faster than we can use it. So in this uncertain, fast-changing environment, when you just do not have the time, you must live with the fact that there are not going to be optimal answers. And sometimes you just do something. You start something and you say, you know, I'm going to learn. I'm going to get the answer while I'm doing this. So no one really knows where this is going. But I can tell you this, that every one of your jobs that you go to after Stout are going to be affected by or augmented with or controlled by artificial intelligence. It's not something to fear, but it is a call to constantly rethink what is possible, to be smart and aware open to change. So I read the other day that the half-life of today's college student, who's not in liberal arts, the half-life of someone coming out of a more technical degree, half-life, five years. That says in five years, 50% of what you've learned is going to be irrelevant for your job. And if you're in a technical field, a computer engineer, two and a half years. And what's driving that right now is artificial intelligence. So. On one hand, that seems spooky, but on the other hand, it can be a real opportunity. But for me, what it says, okay, I got one other thing. All right, who is the biggest, now, those of you who know this don't, I mean that I've told this already, you've got to be quiet. Who is the biggest um, uh, uh, hirer of liberal arts majors in this country? Who hires the most liberal arts people? Apple Computer. So what are the skills they're looking for? So I thought about this, and I thought about my career trajectory into different jobs, and uh, what were the things that I might have used or could still use? And here's some that come to mind. If you're interested in reskilling, and you're going to want to be interested in reskilling, what are the things that help you translate, transfer, go into something, adapt, to a, a different career path. And I'm not saying something real dramatic. It could be exactly the chair you're in, but it's going to be changing. Decision making, problem solving, planning, information research and analysis, critical thinking, creativity, 
and communication skills. During COVID, our son and his wife had their hands full with work, a second grader, online school, and a newborn. So we decided to move from Boulder to Washington, D.C. for two years. We're since now back in uh, Boulder, and our son and his family are in the area as well. We had a small apartment. I had 300,000 people following me on social media. I didn't have any room to put in a, a studio, so I started doing digital work. So I created new art, presented podcasts, presentations, and participated in discussions all around the world. Now this new art. Uh, it's totally done on my iPad, but it starts with very, very, very early images of paintings like you saw up here, and you'll see over in the gallery, maybe a day after I started working on them, and I might work on them for another month. But I took those images, and took them into my iPad, learned a bunch of software, and started recreating them. So you'll see them over there. I like to say that when I paint, that a drip may be random, but what I do with it is not. And so that really applies in life, our life experiences and challenges. How you react, what you do with the challenges that come your way is what's really important. Because we can't always plan, even though I'm telling you you should. But it doesn't always work out that way. So I am grateful that I have had several opportunities to work with kids um, about art. And one time, I, I was uh, teaching art at a local school, um, 1 through 12. And they asked me to teach the first and second graders. So what do you do with first and second graders? I didn't know. So I thought we would learn to paint like my dog, Frank. And of course, it was very simple. Dogs don't know how to color inside the lines. And they never, they, they, they never use the wrong color. They use the opposite color. So instead of red, they use green and so forth. And, and so it was a great way to learn the color wheel. So this is uh, Frank. He's learning how to paint, getting ready to do a painting in my studio. So I um, put up this painting that Frank did. First and second graders, they're, they're sitting on these steps looking at me. And they say, in unison, no, Frank didn't do that. Jackson Pollock did. <laughs> that is true. I couldn't believe it. So that says something about schools. So you know, some parents would show up, look at their child's art, and say to them, you got to keep the color inside the lines, and uh, why is your grass red? So what is the takeaway? We teach kids to color inside the lines, then expect them as adults to think outside the box. Remember that. OK, in a farewell to arms, Hemingway waxes on the courage to take risks, making you vulnerable. But according to, you might remember him, you guys know Joe Walsh, the rock guitarist, Eagles, James Gang. He said, no one ever became a legend in their parents' basement. So get out there, take a chance, share your vision, share your skills, share your art, share your music, share your ideas, color outside the lines, be vulnerable. I'm skipping ahead because I got very verbose there, so. OK. When you are that vulnerable person and you are sharing your ideas, the more indifferent your vision is, the harder you're going to have to sell it to other people, people that are hardwired to oppose change. So have empathy. Be patient, but persistent and persuasive. Learn to communicate. Find out what really makes you happy and really important, and do something about it. Don't waste time on the trivial. If, but if it's important, do your best. There's a Yiddish saying, every time you make a plan, God laughs. Things don't always go according to plan. And maybe it just means that you need to fine tune, adjust, and adapt. But sometimes you have to put it aside and head off in another direction. The trick is trying to figure that out. OK. I can boil the takeaways from the last 30 minutes down to eight words. Explore, adjust, persevere, empathize, contribute, connect, risk, excel. With the caveat that life is never a straight path and never without a fork in the road. Never underestimate yourself. The quality of your life 
depends on what you expect of yourself. So dream great dreams, set high goals. You have choices, make them. You have opportunities, seize them. Thank you. So I left five minutes for questions, and I will stick around. So my next um, uh, event isn't for an hour, so I'm happy to continue to talk. But anyone who has a question, I see some mics are out there, so I'm, uh, I'm set for you. Anybody ready with a question? I can bring the mic to you. What's your next trip? My next trick? Trip. 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 Um, New Zealand for three weeks. There's a question. Can you talk about your transition between the, your probably six in the morning job to eight o'clock at night job and to, and to working as an artist where everything is self-determined, yeah. self-driven, you make the challenges, you have to manage the person, yep. and you have to execute the idea. Yep. OK. So that started really when we um, had our own business, the mapping business in our basement. So we had to do that. You got up at four in the morning. And then when I went to work for National Geographic, I was told by my boss, who was the president, he said, I want you to be the bureaucracy buster. I want you to be able to show people how they can have new and different ideas and they don't have to be, you know, you don't have to follow all the same rules which caused all kinds of grief with the people that were following all the rules. But that was what we were told to do. So we were new products driven, you know, we were traveling a lot, we were, we were talking to people, we, and it, it does take long hours. So we were spending long hours there as well. But then as an artist, you know, the deal with art is just like going to work. Uh, you have to paint. And how do you create? I mean, it's not a, a silver bullet or, or a lightning bolt that says, ah, I have this great idea. Some, sometimes great ideas do come to you. But more often than not, you're painting and a drip goes a certain way. Or, okay, I use bounty paper towels a lot. That's a big part of my art. And if you see the art, you'll see what I'm doing. And I'll try something. I, I've taken garden hoses to my paintings. And uh, uh, I, I used a power washer. When, don't use a power washer because it goes right through the canvas. It tears the canvas. <laughs> I learned that, but the hose, all right, I can't use the power washer, let's use the garden hose. And so I'm always playing with things. What happens if I put some sand down here? And here I am, not an abstract painter, right? I mean, they're, they're abstracted faces, but, but I'm a figurative paint artist. And so, you know, I've got certain rules I've got to follow, kind of, but um, you don't do that unless you're painting every day, you know? You come in in the morning and you turn on the right music and you say, I'm gonna do this today. I'm gonna throw this paint on this. I'm gonna splash paint. So, you know, you still have to come in every day. And what it was like is I would get on my bicycle and I'd ride to my studio before it was in our house. It was a switch. The minute I got onto the bike, my head went, Bzzz, now you're an artist. And now let's go up and paint. Another question? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Your artwork is really amazing. I read your bio and it says you're colorblind. Yes. And I, I your artwork yeah. is yeah. so, some of those paintings are so colorful. Can yeah. you please talk okay. about that? I'm you? color impaired. And what that means is that I can't pass a color blindness test. So you know those tests with the little dots, you know, and you say, oh, what number is this? I can't read them. And I wanted to be a pilot, uh, uh, you know, just for fun. And I, I uh, flew 50 hours, I had all my solos in, and I didn't have my physical yet. And I don't know why I waited to the very end, passed all my tests, I went in for my physical, and they said, no, 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 you can't fly at night, you can't fly in bad weather. Well, then what was the sense of doing it? So I said, well, so I dropped it. And it was great fun doing it, but it was okay to drop it too. I didn't want to crash. And, and so, uh, yeah, and so it kept me out of that. I, I can't explain it. So I, I can, okay, so I, I can look at a stoplight and I can see red, green, and is it blue? <laughs> and and I, I can see the colors on the, on the stoplight. But if a color is getting a little dim, I can't. 
And so when you're flying, when you come in and it's dark, there's lights on the runway, and you probably don't know that unless you fly. And they tell you if you're too high, too low, or just right, I, they're all gray to me. <laughs> and, and so and your instructor goes, hey, 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 you're coming in kind of low. I go, what? You know, it's gray. It looks like it's, OK, so anyhow. That, that's my issue. And it hasn't stopped me from painting. OK, great. Any other questions? Uh, what's the most beautiful place you've ever visited? Well, OK. There's, I, I don't know that I can say one, but I can tell you this. Oh, I know. It, it was the lunch line here in 1967. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like waking up in the morning, crawling out of your tent and looking at Mount Everest, I'll tell you that. So there are so many beautiful places. And you know, we, we see beauty in so many, so many places. And so often, it's unexpected. You know? And sometimes that's the best. And sometimes it's not necessarily a, a place. But one of the things I learned about Nepal, for instance, is it was the people you know, that had the lasting, made the lasting impression on me. It was just gorgeous. You know, I just... Anyone so else? Oh, there's another question. The okay. gallery opening reception is tomorrow from 4 to 6 p.m. at Furlong Gallery. Um, I love how you emphasized being in the right place at the right time. Yep. Was there ever a time where you could pinpoint, I'm in the wrong place? Yeah, and when, 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 when the car flew off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I don't know. I guess they don't come readily to mind. But you, know, you, you, you learn lessons. You know not what to do again, right? And say, I'm not doing that again. And, uh, you know, it's, and, and even things that, I'm, OK, so, so my wife and son and I walk into a, a small clearing like this. So there's a grizzly bear sow there, and here's her cub, and they're both feeding. Here's the three things you're not supposed to do with grizzly bears. Surprise them, approach them when they're feeding, and come between a sow and a cub. And we did that. <laughs> and, and, I, and we're here to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, oh, the kangaroo. That was, that was a good one. Yeah. And the only way I could get the kangaroo from stop kicking me was to kick it. And then I thought, if anybody sees me kicking a kangaroo, what are they going to think? This guy's from National Geographic. You know? He's kicking a kangaroo. So, anyhow. All right, don't, don't be afraid to come up to me. Thank you, you're a great audience.